Hello and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, my name's Jim Robinson. I'm the co-coordinator of the Housing, Land and Property Area of Responsibility, which is part of the Global Protection Cluster. Um, and that uh, HLP AOR, as it's known, is led by NRC and UN Habitat. And it's a real pleasure to be able to be with you today and to um, host this uh, final uh, session as part of the Global Protection Cluster Forum. Um, so just want to say thank you all for being here, uh, for your interest, and thanks to colleagues in UNHCR and also our panellists for uh, creating this session today. Um, as you know, so the, the title of this session is Housing, Land and Property. It's about integrating protection for durable solutions. And the premise is that you know, protection actors have a real key role in ensuring that protection and international standards around protection and protecting people are central to realising durable solutions, that there's a real key role to be played in, in this process. And today uh, we're going to look at what that means from the perspective of housing, land and property, which is something that we see needs to be integrated across all sorts of uh, humanitarian development, peace, environmental responses to crises. Uh, and we look at that from a kind of immediate emergency response perspective, but also thinking about solutions from the start. How do we link this up to these longer term outcomes that are going to give people what they need to live uh, with safety and dignity? So I'm really pleased to have uh, colleagues here today. Um, you can see the panellists we're going to speak to. Uh, we have colleagues uh, Miradij and Alison uh, from Gaza, from Somalia, Mohammed uh, Daoud. We have Muslim Kwazimi to going to talk about the work in Iraq. And we have um, uh, Bashiru uh, going to speak about Niger. Um, and we also have colleagues from uh, UNDP, United Nations Development Programme. Zoe will offer some closing remarks. Um, but the first person I wanted to turn to and thank very much for joining with us today is the uh, Special Rapporteur uh, for the Human Rights of IDPs, uh, Paula Gaviria Batankur, who's going to uh, give us some opening remarks and help frame the session for us today. So uh, Paula, over to you and thanks so much for being with us. Jim, thank you. It's uh, my pleasure to be here to see you again. Thank uh, UNHCR. Thank the Global Protection Cluster Housing, Land and Property Area of Responsibility for inviting me uh, to this event and obviously the Global Protection Cluster for organizing this two-week forum. I'm looking forward to, to see some of the recordings because I, I know it's been it's been very, very interesting. I missed uh, being um, in, in, in some of them, but I know it's been great discussion. So, so here we're talking about protection and durable solutions, and it's on integrating protection in housing, land, and property initiatives to advance durable solutions for internally displaced persons. And um, it couldn't be more timely and pertinent, this discussion. As you said, it, the number of people internally displaced continues to soar while durable solutions, even though we have been working more on this lately, um, seem out of reach, at least at the scale that we need to be working on, on them. And as Walter Kaling, the former representative of the Secretary General on Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons, is also a, a former uh, mandate holder, said, the best kind of protection is implementing good solutions, since solutions are about restoring rights. It's, it's as simple as that. We don't have to find uh, uh, like very elaborate uh, definitions of solutions. Solutions are about restoring rights. In other words, durable solutions are the ultimate protection outcome. And progressively enhancing protection and human rights of internally displaced persons is essential for achieving durable solutions. Durable solutions are not achieved if internally displaced persons are not protected. Returning internally displaced persons to unsafe or unequipped areas or closing camps without alternatives for livelihoods or for people being able to restore their lives and their rights, as we have said, are not durable solutions. It's, it's, it's just not possible. Um, losing housing and land is a key feature of internal displacement, we all know. 
whether caused by conflicts, disasters, the adverse effect of climate change, or also less talked about large scale development projects. Housing, land and property issues can drive displacement, be a consequence of displacement, and as we have said, hinder durable solutions. We all know the Interagency Standing Committee, fra committee Framework on Durable Solutions for Internally Displaced Persons outlines eight criteria for durable solutions. Six of those eight criteria relate to housing, land, and property. This is just one of the cases that we can see um, tell us that it highlights the importance of focusing on, on these rights. Some housing, land, and property issues require emergency, emergency responses, like many of you work in, when conflict or disaster suddenly deprive internally displaced persons of basic shelter, food, water, and increase disputes. Improving secure access to land and disaster resilient housing requires obviously long-term efforts to strengthen laws, to strengthen policies, to implement those policies with budgets, obviously with strong institutions, for sustainable uh, land and urban governance, amongst other um, uh, sectors of, of uh, interest in this, in this type of situations. In conflict settings, peace agreements should cover housing, land and property issues, and address obviously related violations during the conflicts, as well as pre-conflict grievances and the structure, structural causes and inequalities that led to the conflict. We all know, we have seen it, otherwise conflicts may reoccur. Or even if these issues are addressed, if not addressed well, these conflicts may reoccur as well. Um, housing, land and property issues involve many challenges, as we all know, in human rights, in humanitarian aid, in development, in peace, in disaster risk reduction, and in climate change adaptation. They cut across many sectors of activities and of governance, poverty reduction, agriculture, land administration, urban planning, corporate and mining legislation, disaster risk reduction, shelter, housing, transitional justice, rule of law, peace building, amongst many others um, of uh, sectors and, and activities. And addressing these issues in context of internal displacement requires a comprehensive approach across all of these sectors and across all of the nexus, the humanitarian, the development, the peace nexus, as well as the disaster, risk reduction, climate change, and adaptation nexus. Ultimately, addressing housing, land, and property issues requires political will, requires government leadership, requires acknowledgement of its importance for the restoration as well of the social contract with the internally displaced persons. Governments must work to restore the rights that are also at risk or violated when there has been loss of housing, loss of land, loss of property. For example, the right to an adequate standard of living, the right to food, the right to safety. States have the primary obligation to protect internally displaced persons and people at risk of displacement from abuses and have to take positive actions to ensure the enjoyment of housing, land and property rights. This is something that we all know, but this is something that doesn't usually happen um, among, in, in the States. Um, closing, I just wanted to share that last week I attended the 12th Urban uh, Forum in Cairo uh, convened by UN Habitat. This forum addressed, as you all know, many of you might have attended, the challenges of sustainable urbanization, including urban crisis. And practitioners shared some important messages of housing, of IDPs, a few of which uh, were uh, security of tenure questions are foundational for internally displaced persons. Working with municipalities is key, but resources do not always reach uh, this local authorities, local level. The private sector can be important, can be a very important actor for housing solutions for IDPs, and that we need to bring IDP voices into local governance as a central part of the solutions. And I also heard from internally displaced persons and community leaders from Venezuela, from Ukraine, from Cameroon, Ethiopia, who emphasize the sense of home for them that went beyond housing. 
And I just wanted to finish with this because I think it's important. And I, I, I know that you'll work on these issues as well. So um, for the Venezuela person that uh, I shared the panel with, she said that a home for her is where uh, they can plant our, their roots. Um, obviously, in this case, um, they are having to do it outside Venezuela. A home for them is a social network, safety, and well-being, uh, the Ukrainian women that participate in the IDP councils. A home is a safe space for women and girls. It's a sense of belonging. It's allowing psychosocial healing for the people from Cameroon. A home is a social capital and a community support structures, infrastructures present at the local level from the people that participated from Ethiopia. So I look forward to our discussion today, the discussion that this panel is going to have, and encourage all of us to remember that while housing, land and property rights um, can become a little bit technical and uh, obviously are related to tangible assets, um, we must not forget that there are also intangible aspects to it related to sense of security, sense of belonging, and most important, I would say, a sense of dignity. Thank you, Jim, for the invitation. Thank you so much, Paula. Thank you. Uh, perfect remarks there to help frame the session and yeah, really give us a clear sense of why these issues matter. Getting beyond the kind of technical jargon and the technical phrases that we might use in our work to really think about the impact uh, on people and when, you know, where they can live, how can they access housing, land, property for their lives in all sorts of ways. So thanks so much, for that, Paula, and, and bringing in that perspective of how people themselves experience this loss and also what they need. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. And that's really helpful to uh, set up and take us into the next part of our session, uh, which is a, a, a kind of a dialogue between a number of colleagues working on housing, land and property issues in different contexts. And the way we're going to do this is to um, you know, have some questions that they're going to respond to and talk a little bit about their work directly related to this whole question of what does it mean to think about protection and HLP when we're also thinking about durable solutions and working towards those. Um, so I just wanted to give 30 seconds overview on what exactly we mean by HLP. I think Paula gave a great overview of what that is. Um, and I, I just want to complement that by saying when we're talking about HLP, you know, it's another three letter acronym. There's already too many of those. You know, it's the HLP, AOR, the GPC, you know, too many. But what do we mean when we're thinking about housing, land and property? Well, we're talking about people having a home free from the fear of forced eviction. So a place that is safe and secure, that offers shelter, uh, safety and the ability to secure a livelihood. So you can see that it goes beyond just, you know, a roof or walls. Um, it's about being able to access land and natural resources for livelihoods, maybe construction materials, water, things that affect all of us as people. So we can all relate to how we feel in terms of uh, our own ability to live safely and securely. And we also know that sometimes those things are at risk and that can be in all sorts of settings, but particularly in a crisis, when people have had to leave their homes without knowing if they're going to be able to go back, where are they going to be living? They might have had to leave all of their possessions and property. Um, and so we need to be thinking about these issues. People have to stay somewhere when they're displaced, when they're not home. Uh, and we also want to think about what happens then, what happens longer term. So just wanted to um, just give a very brief overview. Um, we're always looking to think about this definition of what does HLP stand for? What do we mean when we're talking about? So I'd be very welcome to hear your thoughts on that. If you have ideas of how we look at that definition and understanding, please feel free to share. Um, but I think you'll agree that whenever we're engaging with people and how they interact with, with land, with housing, with property in some way, there are all sorts of questions we need to think about to make sure that's uh, done in a way that gives them safety, security and dignity, as you said, Paula. So thank you um, for that. So the first part of the uh, dialogue, I want to turn to colleagues from uh, who are working in uh, Gaza and Somalia. And the kind of framing question here is thinking about solutions from the start. So like, what do we mean by that? Um, and I want I'm really pleased to have with us um, 
Alison Ely, who's the shelter cluster um, sub subnational coordinator in Gaza. We also have uh, Miradij Hodza, or Dia, who works with uh, NRC as uh, information counselling and legal awareness specialist uh, in in uh, Palestine, and is also co chair of the uh, Gaza Housing, Land and Property Technical Working Group. Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, you know, how do we respond to an emergency and plan for the future? What are some of the things that we think about when there's an emergency that require? you know, an immediate response, but also um, how do we start thinking about, about longer term? And from the perspective of your work in Gaza, you know, is that possible? Like how, how is it working in such a uh, significant and sort of profoundly difficult uh, situation? So yeah, Alison, over to you. Yeah, thanks Jim and uh, thanks for having me on this call. Um, yeah, so obviously in Gaza, it's a, a super complicated context in terms of everything but HLP. Um, and in terms of what we can practically do and what we are practically doing, it's uh, quite restricted because the um, realistically, there's very little that we that we can do. I think um, a big part of what can be done is the awareness and advocacy of HLP and HLP rights and what it means. We When we kind of dig into what partners are doing, um, we do find that people are doing HLP, but they might not know it's HLP. So then it's difficult to support on that and to bring it out and to advocate for it. Because the, the language, which I think a little bit around is around what you were saying, Jim, about how do we describe what this is? So some language about what is HLP is, is quite challenging, I think. Um, but so so we're trying to work on, on advocacy and, and explaining what it is and what it means. Um, we... Uh, there was a, a mass displacement or quite a large displacement from Rafa that you will probably be aware of in kind of May time. And we were aware that uh, people were moving from maybe from, from homes and buildings and setting up kind of ad hoc makeshift sites. And we were really concerned that there was uh, no kind of understanding of some of the do's and don'ts around uh, HLP. So we put together a very quick guide, like a two pager that was basically what is HLP? What should I be doing and what shouldn't I be doing? Um, and we shared that. And I think that that was uh, it wasn't much, but I think it, it was helpful to an extent. Um, people are also kind of looking at uh, negotiating on on rent and, and making sure that people aren't exploited. So we know some partners are doing that. Um, yeah, in in a bit of an ad hoc way, not in a way that's kind of um, centralised anywhere. Uh, we are trying to understand the needs of, of HLP. So the HLP working group, which Dear can speak to, did do a survey of, of what, what kind of needs there are on HLP and how we can be supporting better. Um, also looking at inheritance documents. So whole, um, whole buildings are being completely wiped out and with it, whole families are being completely wiped out here. And so... People are wanting to know how to work out on inheritance because of the local inheritance rules. So I know that a lot of um, the, the ICLA team with NRC are working on that. And maybe Dia can speak a little bit more to that as well. Um, and also looking at um, certifications of damage. Um, uh, the, the ministry here is looking at um, being able to assess buildings and say what the, what the, what the damages are. Um, just to say some of these photos are here i know they're not super hlp related but they just kind of show that the shelter situation which um can help with the hlp context i think and then just one more thing to say i mean in terms of um of planning for the future jim that was one of your questions mm -hmm. i think there's a there's a huge challenge in gaza about the planning for the future particularly in hlp because we we have no idea what it's going to look like the day after right so we don't know when a ceasefire is going to come and we don't know what the conditions of those of that ceasefire is going to look like. We don't know how much land will be available. We don't know who is going to be in charge. We don't know what items are going to be able to come in. We don't know who is going to be involved. The, the condi there is just no, there's, there's no framework to be able to understand what it's going to look like the day after. So to plan for how to do that is very difficult. In previous escalations in Gaza, it has been clear that um, they know how to they know how to respond to smaller escalations. They know how to support on HLP. They know how to support on on rehabilitation of, of damaged buildings like the one you can see now within a governance structure that exists. But because that governance structure has been decimated and nobody knows what that's going to look like, it's hard to know if we can use those processes that we used before in the future. And I think that is particularly prevalent in in HLP. Thank you, Alison. Thank you. And I think that's uh, you know, a really almost uh, almost a corrective to some of the ways we might think of 
how we move towards durable solutions. Oh, we just need this in place. We need that. But actually what you're saying about what's happening in Gaza is that a lot of the things that we might need to know or want to know, just we can't know and they're not there. And it, and it presents a whole massive different challenge. Um, and, and part of the reason you know, it feels like really important to talk about it is not only the significance of what's happening there, but also is something where we're seeing people talking at once about the long term, the future, as well as there's this still immediate need and uncertainty at, at this time. So it's quite a different way of um, engaging with ideas around solutions and things as well. So, Alison, thanks so much for, for that that perspective. Um, Dia, from from your side, how, how, what do you see that is is being done? Like how how are sort of the the humanitarians there, but others as well? How are they trying to to respond? What sort of things are are, are going on? Mm. Yes, thank you, Jim. Well, you know, amidst this daunting scenario that Alison was uh, trying to depict for us, uh, I think that the job of the HLP Technical Working Group, at least at the beginning, this is what we set out to do, is to bring together uh, shelter actors, water actors, site management actors, um, uh, anyone else who is interested in like mine uh, action actors, to bring them together and to uh, help them or try to understand how we can help them uh, so that when they're delivering their response, they're striking the fair balance with the, and making sure that there is do no harm. And Alison was talking about um, one of the examples where we just set the main principle saying like, okay, this is the do's and don'ts uh, when you're working in uh, on sites, on collective sites. So uh, this is, um, uh, we are trying also, despite of what Alison is saying, like, you know, the future, we don't know how it's going to look like, but we are trying to plan scenarios, different scenarios and how we can work around it. Um, we are focusing on uh, identification and analysis and trying to mitigate some of the HLP protection risks uh, that are associated with this large scale displacement because Gaza is unprecedented in, in the sense. Um, we are also uh, trying to support uh, some of the uh, existing interventions, like, such as, for example, debris removal and management. Um, so we are trying to support uh, uh, that there is a group, the working group uh, that, uh, that is working on uh, debris management, and we are trying to support them um, with what they need. Um, and uh, um, we are, in a sense, trying to think about or find a way to restore the systems for um, uh, documentation of land and uh, properties because that, that's been destroyed uh, during the war. And we are supporting a little bit with the legal assistance on HLP rights. And Alison was mentioning things like um, uh, informal settlement in collective centers. There is a high risk of forced eviction. Uh, there is insecurity. The rent, uh, uh, you know, is skyrocketing. So we are trying to support people with the, uh, making sure that there is some kind of agreement in place uh, or um, uh, maybe negotiating the price down or no rent if possible. Uh, so these are the kind of efforts that we are doing right now, thinking about, obviously thinking about the future um, and thinking how this is all going to look like in maybe six months from now uh, and who knows, a uh, couple more years. So yes, that's that's for now. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Um, thank you, Alison. I, I put in the chat um, a link to the Gaza Housing, Land and Property Technical Working Group has a page on Relief Web. So People can go there and see there's some resources and some so the the document that um, Alison mentioned that the, the HLP due diligence guidance for shelter is there as well. So please have a look. Um, and also just to say, if people have questions or comments, I see lots of people commenting in the in the chat. Um, but if you have questions, then we'll hopefully have a, a little bit of time to come for questions at the end. Maybe not, but we'll see. Um, so please do use the Q&A if you uh, would like to uh, ask something as well. Um, anything you'd like to just add, um, Alison, uh, dear, before we before we finish on this moment? You don't have to. Um, thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. And um, yeah, um, thank you. Um, and now I'm going to um, talk to our colleague, Mohammed, who's uh, working with the Juba Foundation in uh, Somalia. Um, and um, Somalia, you know, giving quite a different um, perspective uh, from Gaza in terms of the way in which people are looking at uh, HLP issues, both in terms of a kind of humanitarian need, but also thinking about solutions, um, just given the, the length of time people have been working on these things there. Um, so, Mohammed, I wanted to ask you, how do you 
respond you know, to an emergency and plan for the future in terms of HLP? Like what can be done at the beginning and the height of a crisis uh, to look at um, HLP issues? Um, yeah, over to you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you all. Uh, in order to understand the emergency in Somalia, first of all, we have to understand the context of emergencies in, so in Somalia. Uh, so in Somalia, we have a multitude of emergencies. And we have, the, on one hand, we have drought, uh, we have floods. Uh, as you can see in, in, in the picture, uh, that's one of the towns in, in, in Somalia. It is part of the town. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side, we have a bridge um, and uh, uh, during the rain, just nearly in Lino season on, 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 on December and January, where water uh, uh, levels in, 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 in Juba River has risen and it pushed away the bridge that was connecting from one side of the river to the other. As you can see on the picture on the, on the right hand side, after the, 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 flood, the flooding. So you can see the massive uh, destruction of the, of the infrastructure there. This bridge was con constructed in uh, uh, 1970, and uh, it, was, it was destroyed by flood in 2024. Uh, so we have multi mul multitudes of emergencies. We also have uh, armed conflicts, whether it is uh, political, politically instigated or, we, or the terrorism, the Al-Shawab uh, terrorist groups that is uh, 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 doing much harm to the, to the people. Uh, nearly two years ago, we also had the locust invasion we sometimes have a public health crisis, such as the outbreak of, of diseases. So when you look at all these emergencies, it needs a co coordinated response. Um, what we do is, um, uh, for all those emergencies, we establish early warning, early action uh, system in, in Somalia. Uh, and this includes an, an HLB uh, messages, the bulk messages that we send to people. Um, you realize that in Somalia, uh, people are not aware of their HLB rights. And uh, we use uh, uh, this SMS to an other um, uh, uh, form of uh, 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 delivering these messages to the to the IDPs and host communities in, in Somalia. We also do the, the capacity local capacity building for the community structures that usually exist in, in Somalia. And uh, as you are aware that uh, an NRC is leading the HLB or uh, clusters in, in Somalia. But uh, in subnational clusters, Juba Foundation is helping NFC share this, uh, this, these meetings. And uh, what we do is we sometimes identify HLB issues in, 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 the, in the areas that we work, we document and we report. What we also do is during emergencies, we coordinate with agencies, including the protection cluster, uh, the local government, in ensuring HLB intervention is uh, well coordinated, as well as ensuring resources are allocated to the, uh, the emergencies. Uh, as you see also in the picture, and, and on, on this picture, uh, we also, after the emergencies, there has to be long-term planning for, for resilience. Uh, we provide uh, 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 basic services such as education, but also doing awareness programs for the, for the, for the community, building infrastructures, uh, community engagement, and also diversifying the, the, the livelihood livelihood activities. As you can see in the picture, this is one of our partners, Concern Worldwide, that is providing livelihood interventions in, in Somalia, helping beneficiaries plant crops in their, in their compounds. What we also do is we collaborate with other donors and international partners so that we can uh, lobby more resources for, for Somalia so as to respond to this uh, uh, emergency or uh, this uh, protracted uh, uh, crisis that, that exists in Somalia. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mohammed. And so, um, how do you um, sort of set the the ground for for more kind of durable solutions for those kind of longer term uh, uh, sort of um, interventions? Yeah, uh, I think um, for the durable solution, I think uh, what we usually do is that we the solutions for the durable solution has to come from the people. And uh, that's why we usually conduct the rapid assessment and we do the community engagement, for example, in 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 in, in Bardere or Tolo or Baidawa, these are districts in Somalia where Jubu Foundation and NRC uh, uh, are jointly working with the with the community so that they can uh, find out the HLP gaps through the assessments. Um, um, one of the 
practical example is where we have uh, done the community engagement and the community have pointed out the HLB gaps. Uh, uh, and uh, there was some interest, interesting thing that they said. They said if they want uh, to launch or, the, or, or if they have the uh, HLB legal issues, they don't have the courts. The, the courts uh, don't, uh, don't exist. Um, it is there, but uh, you know, it, uh, the courts were destroyed by, by, the, by the armed groups. And we have provided material support to the government, to the municipality government, so that the IDPs and host communities can be able to access HLB uh, legal services. We also do due diligence. Uh, as you know, that the HLB is integral to all these other interventions. If we don't do uh, due, uh, due diligence, then um, this means that other uh, uh, interventions cannot be done. So unless we do due diligence to HLB due diligence, then we will not have all these other uh, interventions. A practical example is where uh, in Baidawa district, where uh, partners did not uh, take uh, due diligence consideration, and IDPs were, uh, were were allocated land, and later on they were they were displaced. So NRC had to check in and help these partners to and government with the due uh, due diligence. We also established a protection desk, you know, uh, in, in in this area that we work. Um, where we have the, as you can see in this picture, these are the Duke of Foundation and NRC uh, paralegal team, uh, uh, legal paralegal team that is helping the community in legal counseling on on, health, on HLB. We also provide HLB uh, information, including securing HLB documents. As you know that uh, during the crisis, people usually, uh, if there is a flood or there is a drought and people are displaced, they usually uh, forget their vital uh, HLB documents. And uh, that's why we do the HLB information awareness. For example, uh, Jupiter Foundation at the onset of the crisis provided information on HLB uh, so that people will carry their vital documents when they are being displaced. We also provide conditional cash transfer so that uh, access of HLB, such as rent for vulnerable individuals requiring uh, 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 house, uh, especially for, a displaced, for displacement, for those who are displaced in urban settings, we provide conditional settings so that they can uh, 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 provide a rental subsidy uh, houses. Uh, also, we provide legal assistance and collaborative dispute resolution on HLB, where we, we first of all, capacitate the, the, what we call the CDR. CDR is the uh, Community Dispute Resolution Committees, uh, so that, uh, and this also encompasses the traditional leaders, the elders, the religious leaders, uh, and all those. Uh, uh, the, the, the minority groups, uh, all those uh, selected by the community so that they can provide legal assistance and they can also um, uh, amicably uh, uh, resolve disputes on HLB rights within the community. Thanks, Mohammed. And yeah, there was some of the questions in the chat are uh, coming up around, you know, the role of working with the government and authorities. And, and you mentioned that there. And I wanted to just ask, because um, as in many of the countries in which uh, we, you know, we are working on housing land property issues, there can be very um, strong and effective customary and sort of communal ways of organising land and access to housing land and property. So I just wondered if you could say something about how in Somalia, um, what it is to work in those customary communal contexts. Like, is that different um, to how you might work in, in a more kind of formal setting? Like, how does that look for you? Yeah, in, in, in Somalia, when you look at the customary and communal uh, structure, uh, these approaches you know, uh, in terms of addressing the HLP rights, we must consider the customary or communal. So in, in, in Somalia, uh, customary, in almost all the regions, customary law predominates. And, uh, and this, uh, this uh, uh, is because we engage more of traditional leaders who had significant influence for land in, in Somalia. So the solutions must respect the the local customs while integrating the uh, formal uh, legal protection for IDP sites. And uh, land is a such contentious, contentious issue in Somalia as been, as been uh, in, in as maybe in different parts of the world. And uh, land disputes will be resolved through, uh, sometimes and mostly by traditional mediation rather than the formal uh, courts. So facilitated dialogue among the community leaders can, uh, can help find amicable solutions that uh, honor both customer practices and international uh, standards. While in communal settings where land is collectively uh, maybe owned by uh, or managed by, by, the, by the community, uh, 
uh, strategies must focus on uh, collective decision making involving all the uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, including uh, the, those that uh, 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 hold or, or, or those communities, those that maybe lead the communities in, in Somalia. So uh, we have the Council of Elders in Somalia. Uh, this includes the representative from both uh, uh, the host community and the IDPs that ensure that decision uh, regarding the land and usage of land is equi equitable and, uh, and, uh, and, and inclusive. And it is vital to, and sometimes we usually do uh, uh, awareness about HLP rights among all those parties involved, the IDPs, the host communities, the local authorities, foster cooperation and uh, reduce uh, tension. Uh, the, the most important thing here is in Somalia, the customary law predominates the, the other laws that exist, including the, the statutory the statutory laws, the, the constitution that is in the that uh, that uh, that we use here in, in, in Somalia. So when you look at these photos, we have uh, from the left we have the NRC and Jibu Foundation parallel goals with the CTR committees, that is the uh, community dispute resolution committees during a mediation session in resolving communal land conflicts in Bardari region uh, in Somalia. Uh, on, on, the, on the right hand of the photo, we also have the capacity building session of the, of the, of the CDR committees. So these CDR committees uh, includes the, the minority groups, the traditional leaders, the elders, the religious leaders, and all uh, those uh, the, the, that represent the, the entirely the community. And these uh, committees is integral in resolving uh, uh, land com uh, conflict through the customary, customary way. Thank you, Mohammed. Thanks so much for, for sharing that perspective and for, for, for joining us. Um, just want to say again to everyone, if you would like to you know, put your questions in Q&A or in the chat, we will come to them. And I'd encourage all of the speakers as well. If you see a question in the Q&A that you would like to answer, please do um, feel free to type, type an answer in there or engage with the chat as well um, so that we can uh, respond to some of the, the questions and the comments that are coming up. That would be great. Um, but thanks so much to um, Alison, uh, Dia, Mohammed. Um, the second area we wanted to have a look at in this wider theme of um, HLP protection durable solutions is how do we engage with a kind of legal frameworks? Like, how do we work with authorities in that way? We've heard both both from the Gaza example and Somalia that these things uh, have been mentioned, um, but we wanted to just sort of talk specifically about that. Uh, process because we know that as we're thinking about longer term outcomes uh we need to be thinking about who are uh the 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 authorities in that place what is going to be the the legal framework that can provide some kind of protection and way of working to ensure people's uh, safe and secure housing land and property so we're going to turn now to colleagues working uh in uh, iraq and in niger and first i'd like to um speak with uh, yeah, Muslim Kwazimi, who's the uh, acting head of country program for UN Habitat in Iraq and Yemen. Uh, thank you for, for being here, Muslim. And I wanted to ask you, you know, for your work in Iraq, what role has the legal framework played in advancing HLP rights? And, mm -hmm. and are there things that are specific to our humanitarian approach that might contribute to, to this? Or like, how, how do you see it? But yeah, over to you, Muslim. Uh, thanks, Jim. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, colleagues. It's a really great pleasure today to be in this uh, forum. <clears throat> Although I was uh, quite engaged in it previously with uh, HLP subcluster and we work also, I was chair of the HLP subcluster, but very happy to answer also on this uh, very important uh, question regarding the legal uh, framework and how do we engage in Iraq on uh, protection of HLP rights. If you allow me, colleagues, I would like to just quickly explain a bit of background of uh, the issues on HLP rights in Iraq, particularly on minorities' HLP rights. As you know, since uh, 2014, Iraq was occupied like seven governors by ISIL's uh, terrorist organization, where it left uh, uh, extremely, uh, uh, let's say, damages and also displacement of more than six million IDPs. Yet, uh, among these IDPs, there was also a vulnerable community, which was called Ye Yezidi minority, who were uh, residing in Sinjar district in Nineveh Governorate. It's in northern part of uh, Iraq. 
This community was very uh, discriminated, uh, even also previously. I would like to mention that uh, since uh, Saddam's regime or Wabathist era, where on um, 1970s, the president of uh, Iraq on that time that decided to nationalize the land rights of uh, minorities in Iraq and uh, basically left all Yazidi minority without any protection of HLP rights. Further to that, he forcibly displaced all Yazidi minority from the original mountains where they were living in and brought them in a collective townships, or I call it a concentration camp, where in Arabic it's called Mujama'at. It's a complex where they brought all this community together, like 250,000 people, and uh, displaced them forcibly and let them uh, start and build a new life without any legal protection. The land was allocated, there was no documentation, there was no document that relates community or the households with the property rights. This continue, This situation continued till uh, 2013. After 2013, the situation uh, became even worse when ICL already confiscated land, they sold the land, they transferred the land to different uh, military or their uh, own uh, uh, terrorist uh, groups. And then situation became even worse because the peak uh, the community started to lose track of uh, HLP rights. So we as in uh, as UN Habitat, we started to uh, work on a detailed assessment and having a, a study on uh, basically going back on uh, understanding the root of the cause of the problem since the 1970. So we did a very good assessment. We did the study and then we started to engage on how to do the protection of HLP rights. We have been engaged with the with the government, and then it was a bit of a surprise to to see that also government had lack of knowledge of this community, and they had no idea that the community was basically discriminated, and there was no uh, legal protection of HLP rights. In a nutshell, Yon Habitat started to do the mapping, the registration, protection of HLP rights, and what was most important, we agreed with the government to find a sort of protection of legal issues and legal protection. And we came up with a solution of issuing occupancy certificates where we can kind of uh, protect the HLP rights and document the HLP rights of Yazidi minority. More than 17,000 claims have been registered. We have used the CDM, we have produced the uh, occupant certificates, and then we built kind of mini digitized cataster in Iraq, basically copy pasting of my pre experience in Kosovo, where we uh, dealt with minorities. And further to that, after we secured HLP rights, there was a need also to find a way on how to do the legal protection. Government was a bit reluctant to do this because they were thinking that we have the very modern constitution, we have very modern laws, and there should be no need for protection, but let's just proceed with the recognition of HLP rights. We were insisting that, no, we have to have a kind of document that proves the discrimination, further also looks towards durable solution for the Yazidi minority. In a nutshell, we managed to draft a legal decree together with the Council of Ministers, with the, with the government of Iraq, where we officially recognized Yazidi's land rights after 50 years of the discrimination. That was the huge milestone we managed, Jim, to achieve protecting and providing a concrete uh, example on how to protect legal, uh, uh, minorities or IDP's HLP rights. Further to that, uh, we thought that it could be more than enough, but then once we started to implement the legal decree, we found also some uh, administrative uh, issues. We found some, uh, let's say, uh, non-functional me mechanisms on addressing and basically materializing and implement the uh, HLP uh, legal decree. So together with the government, we started to do draft another legal decree where we can, uh, we can uh, operationalize and use the occupant certificate legally to convert them into full title deed. After one year, we already did the, this legal decree. Uh, thank God it was a, a lot of pressure, a lot of engagement with the government. They were willing to proceed with. And in the Council of Ministers, we managed to secure and approve also the second legal decree, which uh, uh, creating a mechanism on how to facilitate the recognition and the registration of HLP rights. In that, uh, of course, uh, there was the Council of Ministers, relevant mi ministries, very complicated process because Iraq is very, very complex legal uh, uh, let's say aspect in terms of HLP rights and that kind of was very tough in order to to find the route and the way and how to recognize and implement the legal decree. The very last one, Jim, when we started to issue title deeds because UN Habitat was mandated by the government 
to basically uh, give the approval of the legal decree. Basically, no legal decree can be issued. No uh, HLP right can be issued unless UN Habitat certifies and proves the verification of ownership rights. So we played a crucial role into that. When we started to do the, the issues of the title deeds, and then there was another institution with Ministry of Finance where they need to basically uh, get the, the the final certificate. We realized that there was uh, in the in the system in the legal uh, framework where there was a glitch that they have to pay six thousand dollars in order to get the full title deed because you know the title the property that were allocated at that time was public land and now to convert into private you have to pay some incentives. So now we are working with the government. We already passed the first wave of the. Uh, discussion we approved and we have another legal decree where we are going to void and skip this payment for minorities in Iraq in order for them to manage to re to get and obtain their title deed uh, free of charge without any burden in their uh, let's say finance but also will, will facilitate and will help the minorities in Iraq to get their title deed without uh, any payment or maybe free of charge thank you Muslim excuse me um, do you do you have any kind of final comments on um, like what can be done like in our humanitarian responses? So like when we're responding to that emergency, like to contribute to that long term outcome that you've been able to to see? Because I I mean it's you know you've been able to provide sort of a real like lasting durable change for those Yazidi people. Um, so like is there anything we can be looking at in the humanitarian response moment in that immediate moment that might help us get there? Uh, yeah, thank you, Jim. Basically, uh, uh, I think uh, I need to, to, to say also to be kind of proud that when we started this uh, intervention and supporting minority on that time, it was purely humanitarian assistance. And that's what, you know, we, we, we got a lot of lessons learned during humanitarian and also, you know, trying to, 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 to build and see what, what we can do better and what went wrong so that we can correct it quickly. But I recall also before four years or five years, also the special reporter of Secretary General also was involved in this context of Yazidi minority, where they also issued, I think, a report on how we should uh, protect um, minorities HLP rights during conflict. I, I really encourage you guys to read that report. It really have a, speaks a lot about how humanitarian actors should work on uh, protection of HLP rights, particularly on uh, minorities. But Jim, going back to the to the, your question, I think in humanitarian context, we have to be very, very careful on also how we do the approaches and what kind of mechanisms we use when we work on humanitarian on HLP rights. I would say that first, we usually start with the legal aid and awareness campaign. Many of the minorities, many of the uh, IDPs basically had no clue or they have no idea. They are not aware of the HLP, of their own HLP rights. And that makes also a bit situation very, very difficult. Further to that, also, we were introducing the dispute resolution mechanism. As you know, Jib, there are a lot of illegal occupation, a lot of land confiscation, a lot of seize of the property, and that creates kind of a, a universe of the complex issues, which is so difficult, you know, to unlock the situations and resolve them. So dispute resolution mechanisms work very well when we establish the legal clinics, when we establish mediation centers in order to resolve the HLP disputes. And then uh, also there was another uh, Maybe it's been good to mention here the restitution programs. Uh, if, as you know, Jim, in Iraq, we have established a compensation uh, committee. We have established le entire legal framework on the compensation. And with, through this compensation mechanism, basically, we, we managed to enable IDPs and returnees also to have access, full access to the compensation and receive financial support on rebuilding their lives for their damaged and destroyed properties. This really made a, a huge difference in Iraq. And I mm -hmm. think... This was something really very good example on how to help IDPs to restore their uh, uh, life. And then, of mm -hmm. course, another thing that is very important to, to, to notice is the capacity of the local authorities and the community leaders. And uh, at least speaking on, in the Arab world or Middle East, uh, working with the community leaders is uh, a key to the success. Yeah. Usually we were, you were providing the trainings, uh, educating them on HLP rights, uh, educating them on what mechanisms should they use when it comes to uh, obtaining or to access they or to exercise to, to enjoy their HLP rights and then also Jim the very uh, last one also maybe yeah. is the monitoring and advocacy for the HLP rights we never should stop on advocating also with the federal governments with the prime minister for, for example our case 
was key success because we were directly engaged with the prime minister. We were direct, directly engaged with his entire legal unit at the prime minister's office, at the president's yeah. office, in order to secure land rights for the Yazidi minorities. Yeah. And very two last one, gender sensitive Another of yeah. rights and yeah. psychological support. Over to yes. You. Sorry, maybe it was no, no. You know, it's, Iraq it's is fine. such a huge operation, and uh, there are a lot of to discuss about HLP rights in Iraq. Yeah, and we have a, a question later around um, yeah how we sort of are inclusive in our approaches. So some of that's very relevant for that. But I just wanted to note your uh, comment on uh, the the role of like dispute resolution because as you say, there's so many complexities and different issues coming up, and people moving and returning and all these things that 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 having those dispute pro dispute resolution processes either supporting them as a kind of third party or um, really kind of trying to work with the community, the processes that are already there, either local authorities or whatever, to, to make those function well. feels like something that sounds very important in your context, but I know is also really uh, important in many other contexts uh, that, I've, that I know for, from uh, the work that's being done there as well. So thanks. Just uh, really good to, to note that point. But thanks so much, Muslim, for, for those uh, comments on, on your work with uh, you and Habitat in Iraq. Um, I just want to turn now to our colleague from uh, UNHCR, uh, Bashiru Ayubatini, who's uh, an associate, sorry, assistant protection officer in Niger. Um, Bashiru, welcome and thank you for being here. Um, and I wanted to ask you uh, a question um, about, again, about the legal framework. So what role does the legal framework play in advancing HLP rights in Niger? Over to you. Uh, thank you very much and thanks to the other panelists. You know, the legal framework is very important for the protection of groups in Niger. You have, for example, us from 2018, Niger was able to integrate in their legal framework the Kampala Convention, that is the law 2018 on the protection of, of people. So this law defines the rights of different actors, especially the state, humanitarian, humanitarian actors, and the affected communities. So this is so important for us, and our work is how to analyze. Since we've had the adoption of this law, we assist the law, especially the Ministry of Humanitarian Assistance, to disseminate this law from the central part of the country, and we also work with other people. We have a sub-cluster that is uh, co-managed by what we call the Niger uh, Center. And all of these things is to disseminate uh, information. Now, concretely speaking, what do we do? We also work by helping the state, by recognizing people's rights in Niger. We also uh, pushed for a national policy that recognizes the right of uh, local people. And we also work with communities, municipalities, uh, town council, and to develop uh, regional rights and all other aspects regarding property. So if the recognition is already a step ahead on the field, this will facilitate, facilitate at our own level the advocacy for protection of the people affected by forced displacement in Niger. So this is the advocacy that we continue to make on the daily basis. And we also have a mechanism of protection. We have monitors who are deployed on the field. So these monitors, we need awareness with affected people and help municipalities and it facilitates our work because if people are aware of their own rights, it will facilitate their uh, have access to their own rights. Since we are in a system where on a legal basis, uh, everything has to be done correctly, so it facilitates work with the authorities. And I would like to say this is so important because the authorities in the local uh, places, the communities, they are very interested in these uh, topics, 
answer ces questions de LTB. Donc, nous avons une So, we have a, a strict collaboration on these topics, uh, access of IDPs on land, either for land work or husbandry. So, we have been working with the authorities on these uh, right issues. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Bashiru. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, overview of how you're working with the authorities there and, and the, the role that engaging with the legal framework plays. I had a second question, um, uh, similar to uh, Muslim in Iraq. Like, Are there things that can be done through our humanitarian response that really can contribute to this? You know, how does this link with solutions? For example, it might be challenges relating to HLP, conflict resolution mechanisms. You know, how do how do we think about those longer term solutions aspects for IDPs? Uh, thank you, Jim, for this question. What can be done in terms of uh, response? for the IDPs on the field. I need we need I think we need to work with the communities. Before the humanitarian actors arrive, the communities will host people, host them in their houses and if they have houses or rooms. So the first work is to work with the communities that make up the first humanitarian actors in uh, displacement context. This is one first important point. The second thing, as humanitarian actor, when we do assistance, we assist the internally displaced. We need to assist the people there because only through that this will strengthen the living together, social cohesion, and this will also facilitate the local integration. Now, in terms of integration, we don't have to go even further. We don't have to develop infrastructure alone for the countries. We need to work for the communities and the displaced people. This will facilitate the living together in the long run, facilitate the local integration. Now, in terms of conflict resolution, conflict, uh, land-based conflict, and uh, solving conflicts. We are already working on, on those. Uh, we set up uh, a lot of measures and there's a bridge that is made uh, with the community. So dialogue must be first, dialogue with the displaced people, the community leaders, of uh, security forces in the region must know why these people are there, what are their mechanisms, the traditional mechanism uh, access to justice that is also facilitated. So we also work on all these aspects. Now, how can we ensure, in terms of solution, how can we ensure what we can do in, in our response that we develop on the field as a humanitarian actor, even in the rapid mechanisms, it, it, we must integrate all of the aspects because we can give water and food to people, but at the end of the day, they need shelter, they need, uh, because when you have flood, for example, if people don't have shelter, it becomes very difficult. So even in the emergent response, we need to take all of these things into consideration. The other thing is that we need to go towards the improvement of the mechanism of coordination so that the issue of uh, LTB must be cross-cutting. The LTB must be taken into consideration at the level of actors. I wanted to say that one other important thing, we need to insist as a humanitarian actor that we make assessment and a mapping to know what are the things that we can do, what are the places where we will go, where what are the, the solutions that we will find visualiser nos problèmes, voir comment y répondre. Et enfin, je pense qu'il est important aussi toujours l'aspect juridique 
Here in assistance juridique, j'ai bien aimé les... Je pense que l'aspect, je pense que c'est important. J'ai une expérience à partager avec nos collègues de Somalie et de l'Irak. L'égalité est aussi importante et l'accès à la justice est aussi important pour défendre nos droits et pour aller vers une solution en termes de l'intégration intégration, de l'intégration et aussi... Return. So all these three aspects, the, these three sustainable or durable solutions are taken into account in the national law for IGPs. So these are important aspects on which we work on a daily basis. Thank you so much, uh, Bashiru. Yes, and again, hearing the importance of um, integrating these approaches in, in things that might be what we assume are a humanitarian response, but also thinking about how can we work longer term? What are some of those things that we need to have in place uh, to see about those solutions? And of course, the role that, you know, coordination and working with other clusters, sectors, actors, um, how that's really important to try and make sure HLP is integrated and, and those kind of things are thought about in order to have those longer term outcomes. Um, thanks so much, uh, Bashiru. Um, and I want to just encourage again, uh, if you have questions, uh, please uh, put them in the Q&A. Um, I'm seeing till people are, are answering some of those, some of the presenters here. Um, again, keep uh, using the chat. Good to see some questions and some answers in there as well. Um, and um, yeah, I wanted to turn to the third third sort of area of questions, really. And then then we'll kind of go to some of your questions before before we finish. Um, it's around thinking about how we work with communities, because we've talked about community engagement, uh, how that's needed uh, in, in in fact, every presenter today, everyone who's spoken, Paula at the beginning, colleagues in Gaza, Somalia, um, Iraq, and in Niger have talked about how they work with communities about that need for inclusion of marginalized groups. There was a comment in the chat looking at, um, asking about that gender sensitivity and child-centered approach, working on uh, mental health and psychosocial support as well. But I wanted to ask colleagues um, about you know, how do we ensure that IDPs and host communities of, of diverse groups are equally supported through HLP programming? You know, are there examples where inclusive HLP programming has worked well? It's something... You know, we heard about um, in uh, the Iraq example, but I know also Mohammed um, in Somalia, you have been uh, working on that issue as well. So, um, yeah. So who would like to, to go first? Mohammed, if you're if you're there and uh, I can't see your camera on, but hopefully you're there still. Um, yeah. If you had a, a response to that uh, question around how we work with uh, def different groups, how can we be inclusive in the way that we approach sort of HLP programming. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you, Jim. I think uh, every presenter you mentioned the community engagement, and that's uh, in Somalia we have uh, several marginalized groups. We have the ethnic minority groups. We have uh, the IDPs. We have women. All those in Somalia contexts are sometimes marginalized, and uh, uh, it is important to 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 do. Uh, to engage with them when designing an HLB program uh, uh, so that we can hear their needs you know uh, the solution uh, is has to come from the from the from the people and uh, first of all we engage with the we engage with the with the local authorities in Somalia the civil society organizations the community leaders and the marginalized groups when uh, designing planning and also the implementation of the HLB uh, program so that we can ensure the representation of the marginalized groups, including IDPs and uh, host communities. And uh, we we also provide the capacity building for the for the for the marginalized groups. Uh, I think uh, we have done uh, some in, in Somalia and the NRC have done several capacity building uh, in Somalia for the marginalized groups. Uh, but if you can, um, maybe if you saw the, my presentation on the last page, uh, uh, last, last slide, where there was a photo where we were doing the HLB community uh, consultation with the, with the marginalized marginalized groups in, in, in Somalia, one of the towns, Barder, Barder the town, where people, uh, the marginalized groups, including uh, women and children, uh, were uh, children, uh, children representatives, were pointing out the HLB gaps in, in Somalia, and 
and uh, uh, they, 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 they talked about their access to justice, they, they talked about all the HLB gaps, including uh, uh, women uh, in Somalia. Uh, sometimes it is because of the, of the gaps in HLB information, uh, men do not allow women to, to maybe uh, own uh, uh, property or land or sometimes use it. Sometimes uh, women are denied of the inheritance, uh, uh, all those things. Uh, and uh, they they pointed out all those things, and uh, uh, that's why in, in our programming we have done so much HLB uh, awareness, information awareness to to, to men who uh, usually predominate or uh, the, in Somalia culture settings they usually own the property and, uh, and, and, and 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 land, and they do not allow women to own. And uh, uh, we, we we intensified our our awareness approach to. To, to the ATPs and host communities in Somalia, so that uh, uh, these marginalized groups can have uh, the, their rights, and uh, uh, so that also um, uh, partners and, uh, and the government, when designing an HLB uh, program, they should they must also consider the, the marginalized uh, uh, groups in, in Somalia. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you. Um, for that. Um, would anyone else, uh, either colleagues from Gaza, um, Iraq, uh, Niger, like to answer that question uh, and share anything around how they've worked with marginalized groups? Yeah, Jim, maybe just a quick intervention from my end. Yeah. In the area where uh, we work in Iraq, specifically in the northern area, we have uh, more than uh, five to six communities in very dense uh, uh a geographic area where also you have to be very careful on how you basically uh, treat and work with the different uh, ethnic groups because everybody has their have their own history everybody has their own issues with the common ethnicity and i think when we started our project we were very careful and uh, i would say that we started to do a very inclusive uh, assessment and also designing particularly the projects and the support for each uh, ethnicity for each minority uh, spe uh, specifically you cannot for example ask uh, a, a similar question that you can ask for example arabs and then you go ask the yazidis you cannot ask the yazidis while you ask the same question to christians so mapping all the religious groups uh, ethnicities and understanding uh, also uh, specifying their needs i think that was really very good uh, uh, intervention for us to make sure that we can we can achieve success and this i think where, where it worked and we managed to mobilize all the communities together to work with us and uh, do this uh, intervention and helping them to uh, recognize their hlp rights but as i said also you have to include representatives and uh, to be honest you have also to understand the cultural sensitivities it's not something that you know as i said works with one community to another one and i think the transparency and the selection criteria is also a key to the achievement of the success uh, also, I think uh, equal access and delivery of services is also another thing. Uh, I can give you an example when we provided this, uh, let's say, project briefs or uh, materials in different, we made it in different languages according to the context of each minority. And that made the minorities and the communities to feel more comfortable work with us and close to us. So they really uh, uh, had the confidence and had the full trust in us. This is what I think also helped us to, to be close to them. What we did also, another Another uh, approach was that we employed our staff, our team, from the community they were coming from. So almost for each minor, minority or a religious ethnicity, we had our own people, their own people who were working with us. And that's well another layer of trust that the community put on us and they uh, trusted us to implement such a sensitive uh, project. And then, of course, uh, having the, you know, we as Habitat, we are very heavy driven uh, data uh, agency. Also, we, we, we to kind of have a system on tracking the assistance using disaggregated data. For example, if there is a say that we see that in this month was a more support to a particular community, we'd like to make sure that next up, our com upcoming months, we also support other community at the same level. If that was, was just to keep the balance between all the communities and ethnicities together. And I think that was what really made us to be very successful on this uh, project. Back to you. Thanks. Thanks, Muslim. Thank you for that. Oh, excuse me. Um, so thank you for that. Would um, any other of the colleagues from... Uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, from Niger or Gaza, like to answer that question around working oui. with um, 
communities and how do we how do we do that community engagement if you want to draw from other examples of your work you can um, but just how can we be inclusive how can we oui. work with those groups very quickly in the context regarding the context of niger we don't have we have more profiles where we have more idps that could be sedentary and also nomad populations so the approach is that we need to find out how we work with those communities how we work with them you have more sedentary people when they are first displaced they tend to stay in villages, whereas we have nomads who prefer staying at the peripheral level of the village or stay at the water points in order to give water to their um, cattle and find grazing lands for them. We understand these people, the choice of their choice of life depends on their culture. So our intervention is not only specific in order to meet the needs of nomad populations and also the one of IGPs and specific interventions for sedentary populations who left uh, one area to settle elsewhere. Another thing we take into consideration is that in Niger, we also work at uh, recruiting in place. That is, those who recruit are coming from the communities, be it local community or nomad community or sedentary community. And also these people understand the language of these communities. That's how we proceed with the recruitment. So community focal points that we use here, we take them from the communities and we also define with them based on the cultures of the populations, the engagement rules. And during the assessment, can we discuss with women, girls, men, all these considerations should be taken into account. Because if you have to create focus groups, you have to go into communities uh, we go with women that will discuss with women, whereas men are having their discussions aside. So that's how we address this issue of uh, community engagement with regards to IGPs. Thank you. Thank you, Bashiru. Thank you. Um, yeah, dear, I wondered if you had anything on like how do we, you know, that community engagement piece. And sometimes it's, you know, very very challenging as well. It's not like it's uh, there's always easy answers, and particularly in Gaza where things are so like kind of intense. Like I wonder, yeah, if you had any reflections on on that and this question of how we work with you know an inclusive way and engage with the communities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, you can just imagine in Gaza. This is not the first time that Gaza is experiencing destruction. Uh, maybe not at this scale. Uh, but they, they have experience and it, is, uh, it was really interesting for me to learn how people go like by inertia because they've been through this before. So they know where to go to ask for a document. They know uh, which, uh, which actor is providing which assistance. So they go to, go to them and there, there's some expectation on that. They also organize among themselves immediately about uh, around like Mukhtars, which is kind of like a community leader. Um, and, you know, they manage between themselves, the you know, the borders and disputes. And it's it's really interesting to see how people have experienced and they go to this. But then there are so many new things and new challenges that have been now imposed. For example, for the first time, we would have whole families wiped out and we will have uh, basically unaccompanied children. This is unprecedented in Gaza, I mean, because we are talking about big families, they take care of each other, you know, 150 people in the family, and now they're all gone. And how do you deal with that? So it's uh, it's really for uh, humanitarian actors as well, very challenging because people themselves have not been through this. So we are, you know, for the past year, we are learning all of us <laughs> how to deal with many, many things. Sorry, I don't have solutions, uh, only challenges. Uh, maybe uh, Alison has something to add, but yeah. That's Thanks. It. Thanks, dear. I mean, sometimes, it, it, you know, all we can do is try and at least ask better questions or try and understand what it is we need to to know and what we may be missing and where our biases mean that we don't see things. And, you know, particularly if we're working in a context that we are not that familiar with as well. I think, um, yeah, sometimes that's that's how, how, how it, it is. And of course, how we engage with people and have them as part of the work we're doing, if we're not from that place ourselves, feels like a really important issue um, as well to be thinking about. Um, 
Thank you so much for, for that. And, and thank you, colleagues. I just want to say thank you for those that have been on this panel. Um, we've come to a close in terms of the panel session, but we will have some uh, uh, remarks uh, following this from a colleague from uh, UNDP. But I just want to say thank you to Dia, to Alison, to Mohammed, to Muslim and to Bashiru for joining us today and, and sharing about your work. Um, and now I'm really pleased to pass over to uh, Zoe Helter, who's a policy specialist with the Governance, Rule of Law and Peacebuilding Hub with the uh, United Nations Development Programme, or UNDP, if we like the acronyms. Um, but yeah, Zoe, over to you for some uh, sort of closing remarks. And uh, yeah, good to hear your perspective. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much, uh, Jim, and, and thank you very much also just for inviting uh, UNDP to participate. I've been listening and taking notes from my own practice as a local governance uh, practitioner, so I'm just really delighted to be part of this. Um, I think I have to start by saying that I cannot do justice to the richness of the discussion that we've had here today. Um, but what I'll try to do is offer some reflections um, on how to kind of close uh, the circle of the humanitarian development peace nexus, if we want to use that term, um, to ensure that solutions uh, themselves can improve crisis response, just as effective humanitarian response lays the foundation for recovery and sustainable development and peace. And we've we've heard how that how that can be today. You know, we, we heard the special rapporteur state at the beginning that the best prevention is good solutions, and I just want to second that wholeheartedly. Um, she called, you know, also for a comprehensive cross-sectoral approach across the HDP nexus and UNDP, and I think I can say other solutions and development actors really stand ready to answer that call. Um, and so to come full circle, I think what we've learned today is that long-term support to strengthen the systems that can ensure HLP rights can also ensure that fundamental rights are protected in times of crisis. I mean, we know from both uh, humanitarian and development practice that ensuring access to secure housing, land and property can address both the causes and the consequences of forced displacement. And we've, we've heard many examples today. Um, and that's, you know, that's in part because uh, building secure and sustainable housing doesn't only provide homes for displaced people, but it can also uh, create jobs and opportunities for refugee and local communities. It can relieve the pressures that cause spillover and social tension and violence. Um, and so, again, I just to make this point that when we reflect on some of the recurrent crises that we've heard today in, in Gaza, in Somalia, in Niger, in Iraq, um, as development actors, I think we have to reflect on the importance of crisis-informed development and durable solutions programming. Um, for, for actors like UNDP, at least I can only speak on behalf of my organization, uh, we deliver almost half of our annual delivery in crisis and fragile settings. And so we're increasingly moving towards a mode, uh, you know, addressing so-called development emergencies, where we are in this constant cycle of crisis and development and early recovery response. That's the new normal um, and that means, and I think today's uh, discussion has highlighted, that it's essential for development actors to prioritize support to strengthening HLP systems as a means to be responsive to recurrent crises and, and fragility. Um, so just super briefly, like what, what have we heard today? What have we learned? I Again, I, I won't even attempt to fully sum up um, the amazing comments that we heard today, but just as a reflection of whether we can achieve solutions from the start, uh, from the, from day one of emergency response, you know, in Gaza, we heard from colleagues like Alison about incredible restrictions on what actions can be taken from day one, but that there is an essential role that can be played around advocacy on HLP rights and socializing understanding of people's rights um, to help people participate and to ready pe people to participate when the situation um, changes. Um, and this could include, I mean, the great example of just rolling out a list of do's and don'ts of HLP rights for temporary shelter um, and the role of platforms like the technical working group that was mentioned to be able to ensure that from day one, HLP, even for temporary HLP, does no harm. Um, we heard wonderful examples from, from Gaza, from Somalia, from Iraq about the role of, um, of needs assessments and data from day one. Um, regular assessments in Somalia, uh, attempted needs assessments in Gaza. 
Um, and this immediate role really ensures adequate data that's crucial then for transitioning from emergency response to longer term solutions. Um, the colleague in, from UN Habitat in Iraq reminded us of the importance that the needs assessment methodology itself is tailored to minority needs and specific community groups asking the right questions based on religion, based on, on, on minority needs can make all the difference. And so there is something to be said there about that, that continuum between humanitarian and solutions action for data collation, for data anal analysis, for an effective monitoring support that can ensure that we transition effectively between day one uh, action and solutions. Uh, we heard about uh, day one attempts to restore documentation and administration, um, which I think is incredibly impressive. It's it's not an easy task at all. Um, and I think, again, there's a role for longer term support uh, by actors like like UNDP, but anyone in the development space, uh, for example, through archive and record digitization uh, to help play a role in crisis preparedness, particularly where we know there will be recurrent crisis um, as a means for preparing that response and not having to worry about uh, the destruction of a building destroying uh, hard copy records. Um, this comment, I think, on from Gaza about the difficulty of planning for, for futures, I, I just really commend the colleagues who are working in this environment. Um, and I think it speaks to a need to ensure adequate scenario planning by the actors that will follow um, and making sure that we have an agile preparedness discussion, um, that we have multiple scenarios ready to go. Certainly, I know for the Gaza planning from the UNDP side, that's the case. But if we don't know what the future will look like, we need to be ready for any future. Um, and I think that really speaks to a need to move away from kind of linear development uh, thinking and to to being a little bit more hands on and ready to ready to go. Um, just a brief comment on the the legal frameworks. I, I found that discussion really fascinating. You know, I think what we're learning is that. Both humanitarian response and durable solutions work should address uh, barriers to secure housing and livelihoods, legal barriers, um, to better integrate um, displaced persons socially and economically. Um, in Niger, we heard about this incredible work about just the, the baseline adoption of the Kampala Convention on Displaced Persons and the role of rolling out, uh, disseminating accurate information about rights, setting up the local institutions needed to uphold those rights. It's long-term action, but in, a, in an instance where you know that there will be recurrent displacement, um, there's a need to make sure that those systems are in place and that that baseline is in place. And, uh, we, you know, we've heard about this impressive work. Similarly, in Somalia, you know, helping local governments to uphold proper due diligence to ensure that HLP rights are upheld, um, making sure that they understand uh, what that looks like, I think is a, a, an important uh, role. But also not just the government, but acknowledging customary laws and practices and ensuring that there's adequate dialogue um, between these two practices governing the upholding of HLP rights, I think, is an essential point coming out of Somalia. Um, from the UNDP side, I mean, on the, I think there's an important role around access to justice, and we, we heard some examples of that today. I think that there's long-term advocacy needed around legal counsel support, access to justice and redress mechanisms. Um, and so, I mean, like, for example, recently the signing of the Tbilisi Declaration on Access to State Guaranteed Legal Aid by uh, countries like Armenia and Ukraine um, are really setting a new regional standard for access to justice that I think we might be able to learn from for longer term advocacy and action to ensure that countries are ready with legal support, particularly where uh, we see that there may be recurrent crisis. Um, in Iraq, we also heard about raising awareness around minority rights. And I think this role of just actually supporting legal handholding around uh, the drafting of a legal decree, recognizing the land rights of, of, of minority groups like the Yazidi is an essential role for international actors to play, to bring in international standards. I, I know our colleague was mentioning practice from Kosovo, to be able to bring that in immediately to say, we, this has already been done. We know this works. Let's Let's use and adapt um, and borrow from good practice where we can. Um, I think what's also clear from the colleagues in Somalia is a need for um, solutions to forced displacement to be part of long-term preparedness 
uh, local development, urban planning, um, not just that, but also early resilience, early warning, preparedness around, around among communities. Um, the Special Rapporteur mentioned the World Urban Forum, and I think, you know, displacement sensitive urban planning in the longer term is also required, as well as long term advocacy for the municipal resources to be able to achieve that. And, and let us not forget, of course, we didn't hear mention of it today, although we heard a little bit around the flooding in Somalia, um, that this also needs to include uh, planning in, in climate and disaster prone environments. Um, such as displacement sensitive risk management in countries with with rising sea levels and we we see the signing of of certain accords around that um a very final word i've spoken for far too long um just about the inclusion of communities i think what we can take away from today is that solutions to forced displacement are absolutely about restoring the agency of refugees and host communities um, and this can be done from day one i think that that point uh, was absolutely made today um not just in terms of the inclusion of those organizations in frontline humanitarian response, but also just in recognizing, as the colleague in Niger reminded us, that communities themselves are first responders in displacement crises, taking people into their homes, and so they should be included from day one. Um, communities as, as conflict resolution, preventing social tensions, um, are also an important part of, of day one response. And we heard of that great example in Somalia of community peace building and conflict resolution structures um, that, that can help with that. And finally, I just, I felt that the, um, the colleagues in Somalia also reminded us that HLP awareness within communities is also crucial for the achievement of other rights, such as gender equality, um, particularly in traditions where women's HLP rights are already marginalized in customary practice. Um, and so, uh, you know, this lesson of targeted interventions that allow HLP rights work to be transformative for inclusive development from day one. Um, I, personally, I, I, I take that away as an important point. Um, so, sorry, this is this is uh, far too much as a closing remarks, but I think that's a reflection of just how much there is to learn from today's speakers. Uh, and so, I just would like to thank them again, um, and just end on a note to say that. Uh, Ensuring access to HLP can address, as we said, both the causes and the consequences of forced displacement. But this does require investment in, in government and community institutions that manage housing, land and property laws and customs and awareness and practices. Um, the lack of which in turn fuels instability and displacement. And I think what we've learned from today is that some actions can be taken from day one, but also to come full circle that long-term investments can ensure effective crisis response in situations of recurrent crisis. Um, this balance requires committed coordination from actors across the HDP nexus. And I just want to commend that I really think today we've seen ample commitment to that, to that cause. So I'll stop there, but thank you again for, for including us and for, uh, for the words and lessons that have been shared today. Back to you, Jim. Thanks so much, Zoe, uh, for um, perfect. Oh, I can I can sing over the music. I won't sing, don't worry. But thanks so much, Zoe, for um, perfect um, comments there, um, and um, yeah, just uh, really pulling things together and showing the links that are needed and examples where that's already happening. And uh, I think um, there's some encouragement even amongst all the the many many challenges that that we're facing. And so just to emphasise. Please, before you leave, have a look at the conversations in the chat. There's some really good conversations going on and really want to recognise and highlight the comments that have been made, particularly around how uh, we work with like how people who are involved in the context in which the crisis is happening are engaged in these issues and how do we um, better work um, with those kind of colleagues as well. So please um, do, do have a look at that. And if you want to share any resources, this is your final chance to, to do that. Um, you're welcome to be in contact with the coordinators of the HLP AOR if we can help in any way around housing, land and property and coordination. Um, the recordings of this will be on the GPC, the Global Protection Cluster website soon um, and for all the sessions. So please do have a look there. Um, but yes, thanks so much for joining us, everybody, and for your engagement. And um, this is it, the end of the Global Protection Online Forum for 2024. Um, I always think we should save the best till last. And uh, in my opinion, that's what we've done today. But don't tell anyone else. But yes, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, thanks again to all the participants. Goodbye. <laughs>